introduction, Jay, and thanks to Alberta Biosolutions for having me here today. It's a great honour to be here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing, but before I start, I have to tell you why we're trying to find if E. coli really is there. And I don't have to go very far to go back in time and go back to 2012, where we had a huge recall. This was the largest recall of beef ever in the history of Canada. There were 18 people that became ill. Fortunately, no one died from this out, um, contamination of beef. But one and a half million pounds of beef went into the landfill. And this was, of course, from XL Foods down in Brooks. Um, I don't like it when things like this happen. Uh, it doesn't need to happen, I don't think. Um, and I don't have to look very far to, to go back 20 years almost 20 years. And this is a Newsweek magazine cover that was in response to the 1993-94 outbreak of E. coli in the Northwest United States, where four children died. And it was at this time that the meat industry actually said, whoa, we need to do something. And things have changed, and they have improved, but we still have problems. And one of the problems that we have is how do we find those E. coli? Where are they? And so detection is a real problem. And at the, I'm going to go back to the XL outbreak um, because one of the things that happens when there's a big outbreak like this in Canada, there's always a review. What can we learn from what happened at XL Foods? And this is a statement, there's a quote out of the independent report. Um, and what they found in looking back but at the time that CFIA, or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and the counterparts in the United States were finding positives, the laboratory that XL Foods was using did not detect E. coli in those same samples. So this really speaks to us needing better ways to be able to detect. Um, we will always have sampling because we can't test everything that you eat. If we did, we wouldn't have a food supply. So, we have to do sampling, and we have to try and find some E. coli. And the problem is, is in, in the meat system, we know that they're there. We know that they're there in very low numbers. It tends to be sporadic at different times of the year, and those numbers go up and down. So it's a real search, and really what we're looking for is a needle in a haystack. Um, the numbers, as I say, are low. It only takes about 10 cells to make a human sick. So, in my world, in the meat world, our haystack looks like this. These are combi bins of beef trim. Um, this is a picture from Meeting Place magazine. And that's nine, usually a combi bin has about 900 kilograms of beef in it. So you're looking for maybe 10 cells in that amount of meat. And we, we sample and we use, the industry uses statistical sampling plans to try and make sure that if something like a pathogenic E. coli is there, they're going to find it. So this is where Alberta Innovates stepped in. And Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, along with some other funders, after the XL um, recall, put together a call for proposals to develop more rapid, more sensitive um, detection methodologies for E. coli and specifically E. coli 0157 and other serotypes in beef. And I looked at the announcement for the proposals and I went, no, that's not what I do. I'm a meat microbiologist. I don't develop technology for detection. No, not, ignored it. Until I got a phone call. And that phone call came from Cornelia Kreplin at Alberta Innovates Biosolutions. And all Cornelia said to me was, Lynn, you need to talk to Dr. Polarski. She's an oncologist. Why would I want need to talk to an oncologist? I'm a meat microbiologist. What do we have in common? Well, Cornelia just encouraged me. You need to talk to Linda. She has a lab on a chip. She developed a lab on a chip for medical applications. Can you guys work together? Linda knows nothing about meat microbiology, but can you guys work together to see if we can adapt her technology to the meat industry to develop something that might be able to help solve some problems. So what's an oncologist and a food microbiologist have in common? Well, we're both professors. 
We just recently discovered that we both won Azteca Awards in 2009. I didn't know, she didn't know, but we were sitting at the tables next to each other. I, I had no reason to talk to her, so it was Alberta Innovate that actually facilitated a really interesting collaboration. Because we put together a team, it's not just the two of us, there's more people involved. And we've been able to develop something that I think is really cool. And at the beginning, I didn't believe we could do it, actually. Um, no, you're never going to be able to detect E. coli in less than 12 hours. I was wrong. They proved me wrong. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been able to develop. So what you have here is a picture of some beef trim. And we always we start with some dirty samples. Um, beef trim's bad because it's messy. I like using ground beef. It's even worse because all the particles get into the mixture. And it's very, very difficult. And there's inhibitors in there that mess up the reactions. So we started with the worst case scenario. So on this piece of meat are five little yellow circles. That's where we sample. And we take about 325 grams of meat, put it in some liquid, mix it up, blend it up. And we might, if we're lucky, we might find one little E. coli in there. These are the pathogenic E. coli that make us sick, if we're lucky. We can't detect one cell. We don't have the technology to do that. So what we've done is we just let them multiply and divide for about four hours, and then we get enough that we can detect them. So we get lots of E. coli in that mix. We take a little sample. There's some magic that happens on how, what happens in that broth. Um, because we have to get rid of the inhibitors. We're looking at using a PCR reaction. There's all sorts of things in um, samples that will inhibit a PCR reaction. So there's been some proprietary technology developed on how that sample comes out of there. And we put it in a little cassette. And it's a gel-based cassette. I have one in my hand. So what you see on the screen is in this little bag. This little sample can do seven samples with a positive and negative control. It's all um, everything you need for a PCR reaction is in here. You don't have to add any chemicals. So this can be done by someone who is relatively unskilled in microbiology. As long as they have aseptic technique, they don't have to understand really what they're doing. Um, so you just put your little sample into each of the capillaries and you put it in what we call the gel cycler. And this is a piece of equipment. It looks like a, it's about the size of a shoebox and you have a computer that goes with it. And in there, we do a, the PCR reaction runs, and we get some images on the computer. And one of the things that I really wanted to know was, well, how low can we go? What does it take? How many E. coli have to get into each one of those capillaries for us to detect their DNA and be able to reliably detect the DNA? Because one of the things we don't want are false positives or false negatives. And we haven't had any problems so far with false positives and false negatives. So what we've been able to do, one of the results, and this is all for those of you who understand PCR, we're actually looking at melt curve analysis. So this is a picture of one of the, the melt curve analysis for a number of different samples with different numbers of E. coli. And we only need two cells that go into that capillary for us to be able to say, yes, this is an E. coli 0157H7, or if we change the, the primers in the capillary, we can do whatever serotype we want. So if, if I think about, and my, my experience with the meat industry is always, OK, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to give it to somebody in a lab. I don't want them trying to figure out what the little, little images on the screen is or what the melt curve means. So one of the things that we're doing is working with um, another Dr. Polarski, who is a computer expert. And he's doing all the software development and machine learning so that these the pieces of equipment can learn about your samples. The more they analyze, the more they understand what is or isn't a positive or a negative sample. So one of the things that he's done is he's given us a um, software that the first result is this. If you get a positive E. coli, somebody wants to know that the, in that cassette you had a positive sample, this is all they need to see. You can't ship that meat. It can't go into commerce. You have a problem. So it might, if in, this is in the industry, it might trigger somebody to go get a supervisor and say, hey, and that supervisor may can't come and say, I want to know more about the samples. So there's a second layer of analysis where we can actually look at each of the, what was in each of the little capillaries in here and whether it was a positive or negative sample. So you can track it right back to specifically. So this cassette had um, 
two samples that were positive for E. coli 0157H7. A um, little bit different on the sugar toxins, but they're not always both there. And there's always a positive and a negative control in each cassette. So it's, it works really, really well. Um, I didn't believe we could do it, but we can. And it's kind of been a, one of those surprises in life, and that's, that's the joy of doing some science. Um, sometimes you don't believe you can do things, and it happens. So we've got this far. We've got a platform technology that we can use for meat applications, and that's been a challenge. Meat is a really, what I call a really dirty sample to try and get DNA or RNA out of to do a PCR reaction. So we've developed a platform technology, and now we want to look, what can we do with it? And there's lots of lots of other different applications that we could apply this to. I picked some of my favorites. My favorite up there is the sprouts. Um, people ask me often, what food don't you eat? That is one of them. Um, because salmonella, E. coli, 0157H7, and listeria have all been implicated in outbreaks from people eating sprouts. Um, spinach and E. coli is not unknown. Uh, cantaloupes with salmonella is not unknown. Campylobacter we could do in eggs and chicken. Um, listeria and processed meats. We have reasons for wanting to do that. Salmonella and peanut butter and or chocolate. I really would like to try that because it's a very different matrix. Would it work with this instrument? I don't know because we have some different challenges in trying to get the organisms and the DNA out of there. The other one that's really, I think, quite, um, could be quite an interesting application is for water microbiology. And I'm thinking on an international scale, taking the shoebox size instrument that really doesn't take a lot of training to use and um, use it where they're having problems with water sanitation. It takes about 45 minutes to get an answer. With the meat, because of the four hour enrichment, we can do detection from cold meat to knowing what serotype of E. coli that we have within about five hours. Nobody else has been able to do that. So none of this would have happened if it hadn't been for somebody from Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, specifically Cornelia, thank you Cornelia, who introduced me to Linda Polarski. And this is our team, there's a lot of people that have worked on this, but the picture on the left has the core team, Dana, Damica and Yana are, have worked with Dr. Polarski for a number of years, developing some of the, the technology that goes into the little chip. Um, there's Patrick between Linda and I. Patrick is uh, Linda's son, another Polarski. He is our machine learning energizer bunny. It's the only way I can describe him. He just gets so excited about all of this when we get going. The picture on the right, I had to put a picture in a Patrick Ward. Um, he wasn't around when we took the group photo because his wife was having a baby that day. And I'd also like to acknowledge Alexi, um, who was part of our team. And I think I missed a slide. I want to go back. Can I go back? Oops, not that far. There. I think this slide's really, really important as well. The initial funding, um, the call that I ignored until Cornelia phoned, was a consortium of Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, Alberta Livestock and Meat Agency, Genome Canada, Genome Alberta, and the Ontario government who put together that first call for proposals. Um, and that was just over two years ago. So we've come a long way. Um, we're now working with the Alberta Innovates Center for Machine Learning, try, developing new prototype instruments and trying to get them to learn how to do this. So it's been a really interesting project and I'm really happy that I didn't just ignore Cornelia's <laughs> phone call. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a question about the future. I mean, one would be how quickly might industry take this up, but let's set that aside, because that has <laughs> lots of non-scientific connotations probably. But you mentioned you want to expand it to different types of food that might incorporate different types of organisms yep. like salmonella and peanut butter. Is the, is, is the big challenge what the, subs, the material that the bacteria are in, is that the biggest challenge? as opposed to adapting it to different species of bacteria? The, t the technology would not change regardless of what the bacterium is. What changes in the cassettes is what primers we put in here to run the PCR reaction. That's fairly simple as long as we can figure out what primers we need. 
to be very specific for the organisms that we're targeting. The challenge is, is how do you get a salmonella out of peanut butter hmm. and get it into an aqueous solution? Because you have it in a high fat situation. Same with chocolate, salmonella and chocolate. You know, can we work with chocolate in Alberta? Are you going to fund me? Um, <laughs> it's a good fermented food. Um, so the, the challenge is the matrix. And that's why um, when I s initially sat down with Linda, she had no clue how you got E. coli out of meat. Nothing. That was all foreign to her. I said, we have to stomach it. What? We have to do what? No, she had no clue. So by you putting... Do, the, sorry, you have to do what? We actually stomach. We put it in an a, a instrument called a stomacher. It blends it up for us. So we I want to know what it looks like. It's just a box. <laughs> it's just a box. But what it saves us, as I said, we blend up the sample. But we're not cleaning blenders. We do it in a plastic bag, and it just pummels it and breaks it up so we can extract the organisms out of there. Hmm. So there, there may be some challenges with other inhibitors that are in other matrices, so we need to expand and try it. And while Lynn wouldn't tell you this story, uh, if she goes to a restaurant and orders a burger, she, she makes sure with her professional knowledge that that burger is properly cooked. And I actually had a discussion with a <laughs> waitress who questioned the fact that Lynn would ask the burger to be cooked more and said, well, we grind our own meat here every day. Yeah. As if, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the burger was raw inside, though. I wasn't eating it. And didn't get consumed in that state. Yeah. Anyway, thanks okay. again. Thanks,